Thank you, Alex. <laughs> Is this good in terms of sound? Can you hear me back there, Valeria? Okay, great. Thank you for coming out. I really appreciate people um, showing up for the event. And I'm really excited to share uh, some about this book with you and also linking this to a conversation about Columbus Day. I want to start, though, by acknowledging that we're on the Wangunk people's land. This is Wangunk traditional homeland, and I want to acknowledge the living Wangunk who are still here. Uh, they are still here, actually. I've partnered with Gary O'Neill, who's the tribal historian, for a class called Decolonizing Indigenous Middletown. And students did some research to unearth uh, the erasure of the Wangunk people. And I mentioned that as part of my own protocol as a Native Hawaiian woman. That's part of what we do in Polynesia, and other indigenous people do that as well as acknowledge the ground that we're on, but especially when we're talking about other issues that we care about and linking them to the struggles here. And so I want to highlight that as part of my own protocol, but also to link it to the issues that the radio show that this book comes out of actually um, undertook. And what I tried to do in that show is really break through the settler colonial erasure and facade and um, really try to hold up indigenous resistance, indigenous agency, and indigenous voices. And so for me, that's part of it. That's a big part of it. Several people uh, would be surprised, I think, to, to learn that there were three reservations for Wangunk in this place we call Middletown. The traditional homeland is, is Matabeset, and there were three reservations at one time here. What does it mean that that's not common knowledge? What does it mean that if you call city council, chances are they're not going to be able to tell you the name of the people of this place where I live and reside, work, and where many of you do, I know. So uh, part of that has to do with, again, breaking through that, the layers. And settler colonialism, which I'll talk about tonight, that's its intention. That's what the structure is all about in terms of the settler colonial overlay. The intention is to erase its tracks in terms of settler colonials that create new societies in a bid for permanent replacement, permanent settlement on indigenous lands, overwriting or attempting to overwrite indigenous polities and indigenous lifeways. And so for me, I really want to, um, to acknowledge the Wangunk people and the Wangunk ancestors. I'm in my 19th year of living here in this land, and it took me years to even find out the name of the Wangunk when I first moved here, which is a story and a pedagogical it, you know, pedagogy in and of itself. Uh, the other thing I do want to talk about, and then I, I want to read some selections, just some short excerpts from the introduction to the book, is I do want to link this to Columbus Day and what does it mean that we normalize colonial violence in our society? What does it mean that we actually even have a federal, a U.S. federal holiday for something that happened in the late 15th century? What kind of genealogical grafting has to happen to make this something that people want to actually celebrate in the first place, but celebrate in relation to this nation state? You know, where does that come from? Why is that even a federal holiday? We could ask the same thing about Thanksgiving, something that happens in the 1600s or the sort of mythic fable about what happened in the 1600s become a U.S. federal holiday and what kinds of contortions and twists and turns. And again, the normalization of violence and I think this is not disconnected to what we're seeing this week in terms of the normalization of sexual violence in our society, the normalization of colonial violence. And we know that sexual violence is also a part of colonial violence. So I don't even want to draw them as analogies when they're actually related to each other in part and parcel. But for me, this is the work of anti-normalization, and that's what I want to put it in that frame. So I do want to spend a few minutes talking about Columbus Day and thinking about the deeper issues besides whether or not we even call it Indigenous Peoples Day or have a city overturn it, and what does it mean, what is the Columbus, uh, the threshold of Columbus entering this hemisphere mean for the fact that under international law today, the way that Indigenous Peoples rights are governed actually comes from the doctrine of discovery that stems back to uh, 15th century Christian medieval law that actually underwrites all U.S. federal policy for tribes and actually all international law for all indigenous peoples. So I support the abolition of Columbus Day, but we need to abolish a lot more than that holiday, and that's what I'm getting at here. So I'm just going to look at my outline and um, put out some facts and figures. Colorado was the first state to make Columbus Day 
an official holiday in 1907. But the federal holiday is not observed by every state. Hawaii, Alaska, and South Dakota were three of the first states that do not recognize Columbus Day at all. And that was not about it being Indigenous Peoples Day. So it wasn't for that reason, but just to say that there's not uniformity. And more recently, Minnesota, Vermont, and Oregon have followed suit. Nevada does not celebrate Columbus Day as an official holiday. However, the governor authorized and requested by statute to proclaim the day each year. I was living in Berkeley in 1992 when the city became the first in the United States to replace Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day thanks to the work of the International Indian Treaty Council. It was the 500th year anniversary of the first voyages of Christopher Columbus and native activists and allies from all over North America, Northern California, excuse me, organized protests against the quintessential jubilee. The commemoration of Columbus that had been organized by Congress for the SF Bay Area included sailing replicas of Columbus's ships under the Golden Gate Bridge and reenacting their discovery of America. From this mobilization grew the Bay Area Indian Alliance and in turn a political project called Resistance 500. And that was a task force which insisted that we understand Columbus's legacy in relation to the enslavement of and genocidal violence against indigenous peoples. Since 1992, over two dozen, it might be up to now, over three dozen or so cities have established Indigenous Peoples Day in lieu, either alongside Columbus Day or replacing it entirely. And those cities include Seattle, Portland, Minneapolis, Oklahoma City, Lawrence, Albuquerque, last year was Los Angeles, no small feat in a city of four four million people to get that passed and this year over a dozen including Cincinnati, San Francisco, Somerville, Massachusetts and um, numerous others. I won't dwell here on what a sadist Columbus was and all of the various atrocities like enslaving native people for gold, allowing his crew to rape and murder, coercing indigenous children to serve as sex slaves to his men, who in turn used indigenous bodies to feed their dogs. These carnages are well known by now, or well documented at least, which itself raises the question as to why, again, why is Columbus Day one of eight federal holidays? And so what I wanna do though is use this as a segue to talk about the politics of indigeneity and indigenous resistance and what, um, using the term of Gerald Visner, an Ojibwe author, Survivance, what indigenous survivance uh, looks like today in this particular historical moment that we're in here in the 21st century. And um, to think about uh, not the show, the radio show, Indigenous Politics from Native New England and Beyond that this book grows out of, the Native New England and Beyond was to privilege this region and part of that is my own ethical sense of responsibility and accountability to Native nations in this region where I dwell. But that and beyond was to allow for a global scope. And so right now I'm talking about the Americas, but the project itself exceeds this hemisphere. And um, part of what I want to talk about, though, in relation to this hemisphere is what, you know, the Columbus uh, watershed, you know, brings in in terms of that epoch. Some of you may have seen yesterday in the Washington Post a very sizable, in terms of word count, uh, op-ed by Emmett Tyrell Jr., who's the editor-in-chief of the American Spectator, and it was titled, Columbus Day Yes, Indigenous Peoples No. And it was a really snide attack on cities and people mobilizing to overturn Columbus Day and replace it with Indigenous Peoples Day. And it wasn't written from the perspective of Italian-American pride, which we could get into that whole thing, right? Why would you have pride in Columbus? We could think about that with Middletown. Uh, two years ago, uh, a couple people, as far as I, I heard, uh, defaced, so to speak, uh, or vandalized in the legal term, the Columbus statue that's down by the river here next to the canoe club. And I found out from the Middletown Press, I was at a conference at Smith College and got uh, an email from an editor at Middletown Press who asked if I knew anything about it. 
why are you asking? Why are you asking me? Are you asking the chemistry professors at Wesleyan? I'd love to know if they know anything about it. Um, but I, I had noted in past classes, I'm, of course I'm not one to incite violence, but I do think of this as nonviolent, the marking, but other people might disagree with me. You know, I did wonder how was it that that statue stood without a bucket of red paint poured over it, just in terms of the symbolics, which has happened to a lot of memorials and statues around the globe. And to me, this issue is not disconnected from what we saw in uh, Virginia, right? If we think about the whole contestation over monuments and what is it that we're commemorating, what is it that we're celebrating, right? And so I mentioned that. And of course, you know, the writer had to get his digs in there by saying, you know, if indigenous peoples want their own day, let's do it on a different day and they can have it all to themselves. And the snide part, you know, is like we can do it peacefully without a lot of war paint. And this is in the Washington Post, right? That kind of degradation, that kind of snide, um, you know, patronizing <coughs> issue. But again, for me, this has to go beyond the holiday, right? I mean, the holiday matters. It's more than symbolics. Again, I see it as nat nat naturalizing and normalizing colonial violence, including sexual violence. So it matters to me uh, as a native Hawaiian person, as an indigenous identified person. But uh, there's so much more to it, and that goes back to the doctrine of discovery. And so I do want to just talk a little bit about that, and then I'll segue into reading just a few excerpts from the introduction of the book, and then open it up for discussion. I can tell you more about the aims of the book and my logic of selection of why these 27 interviews out of a show that ran for seven years and featured over 200 people. And so that's kind of what I have in mind today. But I want to actually talk about the deeper issue, the deeper legacy of Columbus's voyage and what we're looking at today that actually leaves in place colonial domination over all indigenous peoples worldwide. And that is the doctrine of discovery. This goes back to the notion of divine right that you have the, uh, the Aragon and Castilian crowns divvying up the entire world and giving permission as monarchs, as monarchies, to not only take lands, but to own lands and own the native people whose land they're on if they were non-Christian, right? If you look at federal law today in the U.S. for tribal nations, all of it, without exception, rests on the doctrine of discovery. And you think, how can the U.S. claim doctrine of discovery when we know when the U.S. was founded in the late 18th century? How can they be grafting something, again, the genealogical grafting, right? like Thanksgiving, like Columbus Day. How can you do something that becomes U.S. federal if you think about the chronology and the temporal schema, right? It's pretty perverted, right? It's really twisted. And so you think about that. Part of it is we live in a settler colonial society, right? That's why, is that there's no actual legitimization. And so I want to talk about that a bit. I want us to look at that together um, as a community here for this moment to try and think about what that means and on what basis, on what grounds, is something like the United States government formed. Settler colonialism, I'm going to talk about Patrick Wolfe's definition. The late Patrick Wolfe was an English historian who also had a background in anthropology, who lived in Australia for decades and passed away two years ago. He's not the first person to actually theorize the concept of settler colonialism. There are other scholars and one of the earliest that I'm aware of is a Palestinian who was based in New York City at the time, uh, Fayed Segei, who actually talked about Zionism and Zionist colonialism as a form of settler colonialism. I came to the term myself, to, to that work, much later in my life, my scholarly and activist life. I learned about this term from Haunani K. Trask, who's still living, who's a Native Hawaiian activist and scholar who talked about this in relation to Hawaii. And I do think it's really um, worth mentioning that this analytic of looking at ongoing colonialism, the structures of colonial domination that are still in place, emerge from Palestine and Hawaii. Right? And you think about that with Haunani K. Trask, she actually talked about sell settlers of color, not letting uh, everyone, like not letting anyone off the hook, saying you can't just pin it on sort of white colonial domination we're all inscripted in this, we're conscripted into this project. And that is, if we think about uh, Patrick Wolf's theory, 
he talks about settler colonialism as an ongoing structure. And one of his most off-sided uh, parts of his work is when he says, invasion is a structure, not an event, right? Meaning that we are actually all living with settler colonialism right now. And if we understand it as a structure and the way our, our society is built, and right now I'm just speaking about the US government, the US state, then that means we're all actually implicated in it because we're all implicated in the structure. It doesn't mean we all have a relationship to it in the same way. We have our own differences amongst each other, gender, sexuality, race, ethnicity, religion, ability, nationality, right? All of those axes of difference. But the idea is that if it's truly structural, we're all implicated. And we have to sort out what our relationship is to the, colonial, the ongoing colonial domination of indigenous peoples. And we know, how to, what's the evidence that we know colonialism, settler colonialism, still is with us? I mean, I can cite laws left, right, and center, but the most obvious way to think about it is indigenous peoples aren't holding their traditional lands. I mean, it boils down to that. I can talk about the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. I can talk about this Supreme Court ruling, that federal law, right? To me, the most fundamental evidence of that ongoing colonial domination that is settler colonial in nation is that indigenous peoples do not have their traditional homelands. And that's what it comes down to, right? Settler colonialism, Patrick Wolf's theory, uh, makes a distinction between other forms of colonialism. The most common uh, that people know and the most common that has structured decolonization laws under international law is franchise colonialism. So when we talk about post-colonial nation states, such as the so-called Third World or the Global South, these are former colonies, right? We can talk about how even in the aftermath of independence, they still have colonial uh, legacies that they're living with, but they can actually talk about the end of when the colonizer left. And this is the difference with settler colonialism. He liked to compare it to the difference between England in India and England in North America, right? That's like the most stark, to me, contrast. So, um, thinking through what that means, and in relation to post-colonial states, when I say that the doctrine of discovery underwrites all international law, that's why you don't have post-colonial uh, status for indigenous peoples. And here I don't just mean tribal nations. And that is because all of international law was built for decolonization, was built for franchise colonies, right? What do you do? You have the blue water thesis, is what the doctrine is called under international law, that the colonizer had to be an ocean away, salt water, for you to be eligible for decolonization. Well, what if the colonizer's right in your face, right in your front yard, right? The idea is, where's the colonial metropole? And when you think about the colonial metropole, you know, and this is the myth of colonialism in the past in this country, you know, and there are still historians in American history that would claim that colonialism ends with the American Revolution when the 13 colonies dissolve, articles of confederation are drawn and create these nation 13 states, the original 13 states. That's when English colonialism might end here, but then what do you have is US settler colonialism, right? That's the difference. We think about when Spain, you know, Spanish America, think about independent Latin American states. People talk about colonial Latin America. Usually what they mean is Spanish colonial Latin America. We can talk about Chilean colonialism. We can talk about Mexican colonialism. Again, if we're using indigeneity as the point of reference, indigenous peoples. So those are structural differences. But again, linking back to Columbus, the doctrine of discovery underwrites all of that. And that is to say that there is no consensus global consensus that indigenous peoples today have the right to full self-determination. There's the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which the General Assembly voted on and passed in 2007. It was the year that this show started. And if you look at the declaration, at the beginning it says indigenous peoples have the right of self-determination as peoples. But by the time you get to that declaration, you can, if you haven't read it, you know, go Google it and read the declaration. At the very end, it says, indigenous peoples have the right of self-determination so long as it doesn't threaten the territorial or political integrity of the states that currently encompass them. 
that is that is a precluding a post-colonial condition, right? I'm not saying that post-colonial states don't have remnants of colonialism, right? You swap out, say, an English oppressor for one of your own. I'm not saying that, but it, there is a past. There is a relegation of a colonial past. You can talk about the legacy of that colonialism socially. That's a different situation for indigenous peoples. And by the way, for those of you who don't know, there are only four countries in the world that voted against the declaration, even though it said that. It wasn't even threatening. And that's the US, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand, right? And those were more conservative governments. And when those countries had their uh, administrations change, like Bush said, Bush said no, Obama said yes, they endorsed it. But again, it says self-determination so long as it doesn't threaten the territorial or political integrity of the existing states. What does that mean? I explain it in the classroom to the Navajo case. The Diné people hold one of the biggest reservations in terms of the biggest reservation actually. But if you see what states that overlaps with, you're looking at Arizona and New Mexico and part of Colorado and part of Utah. Imagine if, I'm not saying that the Navajo people are fighting for this, but again, think about the legal framework. If the US didn't put the smack down on what that tribal sovereignty looks like for the federally recognized Navajo nation, you would have, you know, in principle, the legal possibility of an independent Navajo state. Now, there are over 570 federally recognized native governing entities in the US today. There's 573, right? In Connecticut, there's only two federally recognized tribes, right? It's Mohegan and Mashantuck and Pequot. I'm talking about federally recognized. So Wayne Gunk are not federally recognized. The Shkatakok, the Eastern Pequot, Palgusset, Quinnipiac, other people. They're not federally recognized, but for federally recognized native governing entities, including the Alaska Native Villages, there's over 570, right? You had the Virginia tribes just got federal recognition this year through congressional legislation. They are only afforded by U.S. domination a modicum of internal self-determination over their territory, which is a very reduced territory that's held in trust by the federal government. The federal government does not allow tribes who exercise that sovereignty to own those lands in the Lockean sense. And again, I'm not suggesting that tribes want to sell their reservations or lands, but if they did, the U.S. government prohibits it. Because the U.S. government claims ownership over all land and says that tribes, and this goes back to the Doctrine of Discovery, so I'm circling back to Columbus here, that tribes have use rights as occupants over their land. But it's not perfect title. It's this invented concept that Johnson v. McIntosh, the first US Supreme Court ruling in 1823 to ever deal with the native question, created this category, this new you know, Franken title called Aboriginal or native title, right? You can use it, but we own it. And you can use it depending on how, how in the ways that the federal government says you can use it. This again is, we are living in settler colonial structure, right? So with that, if you look at Johnson v. McIntosh that ruled this, it was a title about land title. It was a, it was a uh, excuse me, it was a court case about land title. It said that tribes only have native title and it's lesser than, right? And what was the rationale of the court? The Supreme Court's on everybody's mind this week, right? If not, you must have had a very long sleep, right? Uh, this is, is the precedent for everything. The ruling that, that claimed that, the justices ruled that that's because of the doctrine of discovery. And you think, okay, again, my question, how does the U.S. invoke the doctrine of discovery when we know that the U.S. wasn't created until the late 18th century? Well, the U.S. claims that it became successor to that discovery from England when it won the war. And it's like you just keep going back in that genealogy and you say, well, where did England get it? You know, you can talk about, say, English settlers going, founding Plymouth Colony or Massachusetts Bay Colony or Virginia Colony. How did they get it? This goes back to the, to the Aragon and Castile crown. 
right? It goes back to the 1490s to Christian medieval law that says these other countries have the right to the taking. That has not been overturned. That is enshrined in all of international law. I've learned this from Stephen Newcomb, who has an interview in this book. He's a Lenape scholar who's also Shawnee, who's an independent legal scholar based in San Diego, who says we can't even call it the doctrine of discovery anymore. Let's call it what it is. It's the doctrine of Christian discovery, because it's a Christian supremacist notion of divine right. Right? And he's written about this in a book called Pagans in the Promised Land. And I've interviewed him about that book in here. To me, that interview is still relevant. It doesn't matter what year it aired on the radio. And that's because the doctrine of Christian discovery, again, undergirds all of international law with regard to indigenous peoples and all of US federal law in relation to tribes, all of Canada's law, right? That's, that's the undergirding. So you think, OK, international law purports to be secular. How can it be secular if it's based on Christian medieval law? In the federal, in the federal system, Stephen Newcomb points this out. This isn't me, this is him. He says, this shows the farce that we claim that we have a separation of church and state, not when it comes to natives, right? And once you take that away, that's the undoing. That's the undoing, right? Because you can imagine that the justices today, and they do, the most recent case, they always will cite Johnson v. McIntosh because it's about keeping that in place and that's about a bid for legitimacy. That looks really different than when you are part of a country where you are on your original lands and even though you might have been different ethnic groups, you've made your own modern nation state, like what became England or what became the modern nation state of France. It's really different. Uh, or Spain, what it takes to make Spain. We know that the Catalonian question is still on everyone's, you know, on the news radar, right? That in and of itself is a separate question. When you start to have settlers come and do their own colonial pulverization in the quest for land and other riches, that's what you've got, is they have to kind of make it up as they go along to try and justify and legitimize their own theft. And so that's why I say, you know, yes for abolishing Columbus Day, but it's going to take a lot more than that. It's going to take a lot more than creating indigenous people's days all over this country. That's not really a structural change. That's a form of anti-normalization, I think, is important. So um, that's sort of where I'm at in terms of that convo part. And what I'd like to do now is just read a few excerpts from the introduction. Um, are there any burning questions about anything I've just said before I switch gears? Thank you. So the book is titled Speaking of Indigenous Politics, Conversations with Activists, Scholars, and Tribal Leaders. And as I mentioned before, it comes out of a radio show that I produced and hosted at WESU, just up the street here. And the show aired from 2007 to 2013. I have an audio archive of all the shows, except one uh, that I actually didn't record. Um, everything else and on purpose uh, everything else should be online so you don't need to buy the book to hear those interviews um, but I did select I cherry-picked there were so many I wanted to include everyone says this I wished I could have included it but I couldn't I really mean that there were many I wished I could have included and I really couldn't but um, one of the things I'll, I'll mention before I dive into the reading is just kind of who's in here and um, I do want to mention that I, I've dedicated this book in memory to Gail Corey Tonsing, who passed away earlier this year. She was a Connecticut-based journalist of Palestinian and Lebanese descent who was an outstanding staff reporter for Indian Country Today. Her friendship and significant work covering indigenous issues in Native North America were instructive and continue to inspire me. The book is published on the University of Minnesota Press in a series that Robert Warrior, who's an Osage scholar based at the University of Kansas, edits. He wrote the foreword to the book. He's an a intellectual giant in the field of literary studies, theology, and also native studies. And um, he wrote the foreword, and I'll just mention who's in here. Jesse Little Doe Baird, talking about reviving the Wampanoag language. 
Omar Barghouti on the ethics of boycott, divestment, and sanctions targeting Israel. Lisa Brooks on the recovery of native space in the Northeast. Kathleen Brown Perez on tribal legitimacy in the face of termination. She's talking about her own tribal nation, the Brothertons, who were actually uh, denied federal recognition, and she gets at why that happened and how. Margaret Bruchak on erasure and the unintended consequences of repatriation legislation. Jessica Catalino on Indian gaming, renewed self-governance, and economic strength. David Cornsilk on Freedmen's citizenship rights at Cherokee Nation. Sarah Deer on Native women and sexual violence. Philip Deloria on genealogies of activism and scholarship. The late, Tanya, now late, Tanya Ganella Fritchner on developing the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. She worked on that for decades. And she uh, gave this interview right after it passed. Pone Harawita on Maori activism and sovereignty. Suzanne Shonharjo on the 20th anniversary of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Winona LaDuke on environmental activism. Maria LaHood and Rashid Khalidi on Zionist excavations at the Mamilla Cemetery in Jerusalem. James Luna, who has passed away this year, on the performance art of irony. Chief Many Hearts Lynn Malerba. The, uh, on Mohegan tribal resilience and leadership, the first uh, female chief at Mohegan in over 300 years. Aileen Morton Robinson on whiteness and indigeneity in Australia. Stephen Newcomb, who I mentioned, on decoding the Christian doctrine of discovery. Jean M. O'Brien on tracing the origins and the persistent myth of the vanishing Indian. Jonathan Kamako Viva Ole Osorio on the Hawaiian land case that went before the Supreme Court. Stephen Salaita on colonization and ethnic cleansing in North America and Palestine. Paul Chat Smith on the politics of representation. He's a curator at the uh, National Museum of the American Indian. Cersei Sturm on Cherokee identity politics and the phenomenon of racial shifting. You know, why do you have people who are white all of a sudden decide that they're Cherokee? What's going on with that? Margot Tamez on indigenous resistance to the US-Mexico border wall. She and her mother founded an organization that sued the U.S. Department of Defense, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, and the U.S. Department of the Interior for cutting through their family Apache lands. Chief Richard Velke here in Connecticut on the Shkatakoke struggle for federal recognition. And then Robert Warrior, who I mentioned earlier, on his concept, he's um, theorized on intellectual sovereignty and the work of the public intellectual, and then the late Patrick Wolf in terms of talking about settler colonialism. And what I would mention about those interviews, and you'll you'll find this if you do pick up the book or you know check it out from your library or ask your library to buy it. If you don't buy it yourself, uh, we need to get the libraries um, accessing, uh, getting access for people. But the the point here for me is that I do a lot of legal history and contemporary politics, and for me the radio show is really about unpacking these things for a general listening audience, and for the book for a general readership. So this is a bit on the, um, I'm just going to read a little, a few excerpts from the introduction. And I just want to acknowledge Gary O'Neill, Wangunk elder who has made it here. It's so great to see you. Aloha. Thank you for being here. The state of native and indigenous political resurgence and resistance in this 21st century moment is exciting and has much to teach the rest of the world. We can see this in the ongoing no dapple struggle to stop the Dakota Access Pipeline. The Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, who led this effort, guided by the principle of Minwakoni, water is life. We've also witnessed a fierce stance in the battle over the 30-meter telescope at Mauna Awakea on Hawaii Island, a $1.4 billion project for an 18-story observatory on the summit that Kanaka Maoli Native Hawaiians consider sacred. Calling out, Ku Kia'i Mauna, Kanaka Maoli protectors have taken up the struggle to guard the mountain. Both are cases of indigenous resistance to extractive economies, rampant capitalism, and militarized violence, and involve thousands of indigenous individuals and diverse allies lending their support and solidarity. And more recently, in December 2017, continuing to this moment, Trump announced he would reduce the size of Bears Ears National Monument in southern Utah, 
a site sacred to indigenous peoples in the region in order to open it up for mining. Leading the resistance, the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition launched by the Hopi Tribe, Navajo Nation, Ute Mountain, Ute Tribe, Pueblo of Zuni, and the Ute Indian Tribe has amassed the support of 30 tribal nations with ancestral, historical, and contemporary ties to the Bears Ears region, committed to protecting the site and advancing their own Bears Ears conservation proposal. While these struggles eventually gained some mainstream media attention, most indigenous people's activism is too often invisible to the dominant settler colonial society. This underscores the importance of independent media in making visible the diverse struggles and forms of resistance. In February 2007, I launched a public affairs radio show called Indigenous Politics from Native New England and Beyond at WESU, a radio station affiliated with Wesleyan University where I teach. The use of Native New England and Beyond in the subtitle of the program was a political decision, part of my commitment to support the struggles of indigenous peoples of the region, as well as to cover those issues in relation to global indigenous struggles beyond. I featured interviews with nearly 200 uh, indigenous officials, political leaders, activists, scholars, cultural workers, and artists about a range of topics documenting native resistance to settler colonialism. And I say they're near 200, and earlier I said over 200, and that's because I aired some people's talks and lectures. So there's over 200 people featured on the show, nearly 200 that are interview-based. The 30 interviews included here of, of 27 people, some are, are follow-up interviews that I did around an ongoing struggle, are just a slice of the vast audio archive. One of the aims of indigenous politics, the show, was to address the politics of erasure. Notably, the conversations the radio show produced were themselves a political act against that ongoing violence and the logic of elimination endemic to settler colonialism. Patrick Wolf contrasts settler colonialism with franchise colonialism through comparative work focused on Australia, Israel-Palestine, and the United States, showing how the former is premised on the logic of elimination of indigenous peoples. As he theorized, and as Wolf discussed in his interview included here, because settler colonialism destroys to replace, it is, quote, inherently eliminatory, but not invariably genocidal, end quote. He was careful to point out that there are cases of genocide without settler colonialism, and that in the context of settler colonialism, quote, elimination refers to more than the summary liquidation of indigenous peoples, though it also includes that, end quote. Hence, he suggested that structural genocide avoids the question of degree and enables an understanding of the relationships between spatial removal, mass killings, and biocultural assimilation that is coercive. In other words, the logic of elimination of the native is also about the elimination of the native as native. Because settler colonialism is a land-centered project entailing permanent settlement, or bids for permanent settlement, Wolf says, quote, settler colonizers come to stay. Invasion is a structure, not an event. As a result, settler colonialism cannot be relegated to the past. It is an ongoing process. Importantly, indigeneity is a counterpart analytic to settler colonialism. And indigeneity itself is enduring. Hence, the operative logic of settler colonialism may be to eliminate the native but indigenous peoples exist, resist, and persist. Moreover, settler colonialism is a structure that endures indigeneity, even as it holds out against it. Wesleyan University and its listener-supported radio station, WESU, are located here in Middletown, Connecticut. The indigenous place name is Matabeset, and the indigenous people of the land are the Wangunk, part of the Algonquian cultural linguistic group. Although regarded as largely extinct prior to the American Revolution, Wangunks continue to live into the 21st century. There is a little known history, one submerged within a landscape of overdetermined by settler colonialism. This history of erasure of this place and its original inhabitants is common not just in Middletown, but throughout the Northeast. When I first moved to Connecticut from California in 2000, I wanted to find out who the people of the land in this place we call Middletown are. I called the city council and asked, 
but was told there were none, and my asking was not taken kindly to. Others I asked mentioned the Mashantucket Pequots and the Mohegans, the only two federally recognized tribes in Connecticut, both better known in some part due to their casinos, Foxwoods and the Mohegan Sun, respectively. It wasn't long before I caught wind of the anti-Indian initiatives emanating from officials in the state, including then Attorney General Richard Blumenthal, now U.S. Senator, and then U.S. Senator Christopher Dodd. The tribe's wealth has had visibly stirred non-native, predominantly white resentment by those I call the 21st century Indian haters. During that time in the early 2000s, some even held town hall meetings to confirm what they saw as the Indian problem, namely the possibility of new casinos of the three tribal nations that have state recognition, the Shkatakok, Eastern Pequots, and Golden Hill Paugussets, who were petitioning for federal recognition at that time. One way I made a few inroads within that climate, that hostile political climate, was through the anchoring of the radio program. To my knowledge, it was the only native issue show produced in New England at the time. However, I didn't come at it with a journalistic approach, but out of a responsibility to the indigenous peoples of the region where I reside, as someone not of that place, not of this place. and in an effort to engage in the work of a public intellectual. The show was explicitly pro-sovereignty and in solidarity with indigenous people and peoples. My aim was to connect my ongoing academic work to my political activism to the public realm in order to address what I see as major social concerns. The program aimed to reach multiple audiences about serious political and cultural issues. I designed it to provide a platform for the general public to think carefully about a range of indigenous politics that shape everyday life in native New England and beyond in an accessible language that was also analytically rigorous. This was my own version of what they call digital humanities, engaging the public in critical conversations. As such, the show became an experiment in civic education by, in part, unpacking legal issues for a lay audience. The program included episodes on indigenous activism in various parts of Canada, Latin America, including Mexico, Chile, Bolivia, and Peru, Palestine, Hawaii, Australia, and Aotearoa, also known as New Zealand. I focused on themes such as land desecration, treaty rights, political status, and cultural revitalization, and aimed to bring American Indian and other indigenous issues and voices to the airwaves by providing crucial commentary rooted in the scholarly research and activism of Native peoples and our allies. The air dates of the program from 2007 to 2013 spanned many critical developments in the indigenous world globally. An international academic meeting held at the University of Oklahoma in April 2007 led to the establishment of the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association the following year, which I helped co-found as part of a six-person steering committee. And I'll pause to say that Robert Warrior was also one of those six people, and NISA, the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association, was his sort of brainchild, that was his idea. On September 13, 2007, the UN General Assembly passed the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples despite opposition from the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Other exciting developments during the years the show aired include the launching of the US campaign for the academic and cultural boycott of Israel, which is part of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement called for by Palestine civil society to put nonviolent pressure on Israel until it complies with international law. That same year, we saw Bolivia write provisions for indigenous peoples into its state constitution through a narrow but major referendum. The year 2011 saw the founding of the Maori Party, a New Zealand political party with Hone Harawera initially at the helm. And in 2012, we saw the formation of Idol No More, an ongoing grassroots movement among the First Nations, Metis, and Inuit peoples, along with non-Indigenous supporters challenging Canadian state power. These are just a few important developments that occurred during the program's airing. For readers and past listeners asking what the value of publishing these interviews is now, 
after the show has ended, I suggest that they can still teach us about the politics of settler colonialism and indigenous resistance. In relation to native and indigenous studies alone, the interviews provide a window into an entire field in an accessible form from some high profile scholars. They also serve to document a period of history in terms of regional and global indigenous resistance. But besides offering a rich archive of these mere developments, because the struggles facing indigenous peoples have not changed in structural terms, but have intensified in many ways, especially with the onslaught of neoliberal policies, most of these interviews offer crucial genealogical contexts for so many ongoing political cases. And that's the excerpt that I have for you. I'll say that the, the uh, introduction goes on to actually look at the Shkatakok case for federal recognition and the way that the state officials here, largely Democrats, basically got in bed with the, with the Bush White House to stop their federal recognition after it was already granted by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. It's a complete new, uh, it was a complete uh, first, if you will, not the kind of first you want to brag about, or maybe they do. Um, in contrast to the Native Hawaiian case for federal recognition, which is actually driven by state officials. And so for the rest of the introduction, besides talking about some of the interviews themselves, I actually use that as a way to talk about what it means to be attentive to a politics of location. You know, that federal recognition in the Hawaii context is really a land grab for federal militarization. And yet, in New England, state officials and the federal government at large doesn't want to recognize tribes by and large or native peoples. And so I use that in the introduction as a way to contrast these two case studies because they were ongoing through those years. The Shkatakot case, um, the Shkatakot people, the tribe, are still actually really fighting for basic rights of self-determination in terms of, of business ventures off the reservation, which is in Kent. Um, and for the Akaka Bill, which is the federal legislation that was before Congress off and on for 12 years, even though that legislation finally um, died due to Republican opposition, didn't die for the right reasons, it died because of, of right-wing opposition to any form of recognizing Hawaiian sovereignty. Um, there are still people making an end run around the legislative branch and trying to move it through the Department of the Interior. So even those two cases, nothing's really ended, it's sort of shape-shifted into something else. But I really kind of delve in there to talk about what does it mean when, you know, a lot of the show at the time was really dealing with these cases because the Shkatakog as well as the Eastern Pequot, their cases were approved and then later revoked. And that was going on at the time and it was really a, a big deal. I mean, it's a big deal in terms of precedent. And that was going on at the same time this Hawaii proposal just wouldn't stop, you know. I mean, many of us tried to stop it and, and effectively kill the legislative piece, but you see that it's still coming back around in other uh, branches of government. So um, with that, before I open it up to questions, I did want to make a plug about something else. Um, November 10th, here in this same space, there will be a trio um, book launch. And this is a, what we call an edited volume. I wrote the introduction and I did some light editing on the interviews, you know, so I took out the ums and the ahs uh, for print. But I have a monograph that just literally just came out last week called Paradoxes of Hawaiian Sovereignty, Land, Sex, and the, did you hear that? Land, Sex, you're like, okay, I just woke up. Land, Sex, and the Colonial Politics of State Nationalism. So this is a monograph that we'll be um, doing a book launch for with my colleague, my new colleague, Joey Weiss, who will be presenting his book, which just came out a couple weeks ago. Would you mind saying the title for everyone? Shaping the Future on Haida Gwaii, Life Beyond Settler Colonialism. So very much in dialogue with uh, the conversation we're having here tonight, and also pushing it in other ways towards Canada, where I work.